Now, where do we get the notion of the priesthood in the Bible? This might be, out of all the sacraments, the most hotly contested. Because if you know anything about history, you know that the Protestant Reformation was, in essence, a rejection of the priesthood. That's what the Protestant Reformation, at the end of the day, was about. It was about rejecting the notion of a sacrificial, ministerial, hierarchical priesthood. And many of the Protestants said, priesthood is unbiblical. There's no evidence for a priesthood in the New Testament. In fact, you never see the word priest used to refer to the apostles. You do see the word elder, but you don't see the other Greek word for priest, hierus, right? which was the word for the Jewish priest in the temple. So the Protestants said, look, priesthood is not biblical. And that's why to this day, if you go to a Protestant church, I've had Catholics do this, please don't call the pastor father, right? That's not, he's not a priest, and he would be offended if you saw him as one in most cases. What do, you call, what do Protestants call their leaders? They call them pastors, right? Preachers, evangelists, but never priests. Where did we get the notion of a priesthood from? Did Jesus institute a priesthood? Now, if you go through your New Testament and you open it up and you read through it and try to find any passage that says Jesus instituted the apostles as priests, guess what? you're not going to find it. It's not there. But if you read the New Testament through Jewish eyes, you're going to see that that's exactly what he did. And let me give you an example. I want to pull you back in time for a second to Exodus 24, the first quote here, which is the story of Moses and the priests of Israel. Now watch this, because you may have heard some of this other stuff before, but this should be new. So something fresh here for you, I'd like to suggest to you. In, in this passage, uh, the Old Testament is describing a priestly liturgy that took place on Mount Sinai. After the 12 tribes got to the mountain, they went up the mountain, they received the Ten Commandments, and once they received the Ten Commandments, the next thing they did was had a liturgy, a worship service. And guess who headed up the worship service? The priests. They offered sacrifice. That was the essence of worship. Now, look at the description of this, and I want you to see something. And I want you to pay attention to the priests and to the numbers. It says this. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship afar off. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Notice, there's a distinction here between the laity, the people, and who? Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, all the priests, okay? So he, Moses, rose early in the morning. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Pause. Again, notice, if these young men are offering sacrifice, who do they have to be? They have to be priests. Only priests can offer sacrifice. If, you don't, if you're not a priest and you offer sacrifice in the Old Testament, you could be put to death. To death. All right? So these are priests from each of how many tribes? Twelve. <laughs> Pay attention. That's important. So after they offer sacrifice, what does Moses do as kind of like the chief priest? He takes the blood and he put it in a basin and half of the blood he threw against the altar... And then Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant. Heard those words lately? This is the blood of the covenant. Who else says that? Jesus. Where does he say it? The Last Supper. What's going on here? Jesus is like a new Moses. He's like a new priest. Moses says, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Exodus 24. Now, what I want you to see is if you look at the handout here, there's a striking series of parallels between Jesus and his apostles and Moses and the Old Testament priests. Look at the hierarchy that's arranged here. In the Old Covenant priesthood, you have Moses, number one, at the top. In the New Covenant priesthood, who's at the top? Jesus. In the Old Covenant priesthood, after Moses, you have number one, who is Aaron, his brother, who acts as high priest. In the New Covenant, who acts as the number one man next to Jesus? 
Peter, who is chief of the apostles. In the Old Testament, then after Aaron, you have three others mentioned. Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. Those were his two sons. Aaron and these two brothers, Nadab and Abihu. The three who would go up to the top of the mountain with Moses. In the New Testament, you also have three. Who are they? Peter, James, and John. Peter and two brothers. Interesting. What does that suggest? Peter's like the chief priest, and James and John are like Adab and Nabihu, these priestly elders who are the highest of the twelve. After the three in the Old Testament, you have twelve pillars and the young men from the twelve tribes. In the New Testament, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, you have the twelve apostles. And then finally, everyone forgets about these, but in the Old Testament, you have the 70 elders of Israel. And in the New Testament, remember in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus sends out how many apostles? 70, those strange 70 disciples. They're only mentioned once. Why did he do that? Why did he set up his disciples to have 1, 3, 12, and 70? Why did he set up these various circles of disciples around them? Because he was establishing a new priesthood. Do you see it? He didn't have to shout it from the rooftops. He didn't have to say the word priest. Any first century Jew would have known that this circle of hierarchy was a priestly hierarchy. Do you think Jesus knew Exodus 24? You think he knew the story of Moses? Say yes. Yes, of course he knew it, right? So this is not a coincidence. Jesus deliberately organized his disciples based on the priesthood of the Old Testament. All right, turn your page and we're coming quickly to the end. Just a couple of more points. Not only does Jesus himself establish a priestly hierarchy of his disciples, and notice, too, there are questions sometimes, we don't have time to get in this tonight uh, in any detail, but everyone in those circles, the one, the three, the twelve, and the seventy, they were all what? They were all men, weren't they? The notion of a priesthood that's only male not only goes back to the early New Testament, but to, the, but to Christ himself and all the way to the Old Testament. But that's another talk for another time. What I want you to see is that this priesthood of Jesus, the original hierarchy, then develops, and in the New Testament church, we have a threefold hierarchy of three categories. Bishops, priests or presbyters, and deacons. And these are mentioned in a number of texts, in particular the letters of Paul to 1 Timothy, and Titus. And you can go and read those on your own time. I've got the passages here on the handout. For the sake of time, I don't want to go through them. But what I want you to see is that the notion of having three levels of authority, bishops, priests, and deacons, is not something that was just made up. Guess what it was modeled on? The Old Testament priesthood. In the Old Testament, there was a natural family hierarchy where Aaron acted as high priest, his sons were ministerial priests, and then the Levites were like priestly assistants. They were like who? The deacons. The deacons. Aaron and his sons would offer sacrifice. They would offer the incense. But the Levites worked in the tabernacle and did other rituals that were special to them. So you can see even the threefold priesthood of the Catholic Church goes back to not just the New Testament, but to the Old Testament as well. One final question, and we'll end here, about the priesthood is what? Celibacy. Isn't that the question everyone has? Celibacy. Where do you Catholics get the idea that priests should be celibate? Have you ever heard this one? Have you ever wondered it yourself, right? Why do we as Catholics have a celibate priesthood? Where do we get that notion? Now, there are all kinds of explanations and reasons running around out there, many of which are false. I've heard often, I don't know where this came from, that in the Middle Ages, the church instituted a celibate priesthood so that she could hang on to the land that she had gained from various medieval uh, lords and ladies and kings and queens. Okay, that's just lame, all right? And it's also false. It's not true at all. Celibacy is being practiced all the way back in New Testament times. In fact, many people don't know this, but in the Old Testament, when you served as priest in the temple, you didn't do it forever. You would do it temporarily from the ages of 20 to 50 or so, or 30 to 50. It depends on a couple of different texts, have different year, years. But you would only go in for a few weeks or a month, once a year. But when you served as priest in the temple, even though you were married, guess what you had to abstain from? 
marital relations, sexual intercourse. Because as a priest in the temple, you had to practice a kind of temporary celibacy. Now that's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, do priests just serve once a month or once a year? Does that sound good, Father? It might, it might sound good, right? <laughs> One month per year, 20 years, then you retire. How's that sound? Pretty good, right? But that's not the reality. In the New Testament, when a man is ordained, the bishop says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, right? It's a, it's a lifelong vocation. And so celibacy forever is a fitting reality. But where do we get the notion that priests should be celibate? Well, two places. I don't have it on the handout, but in Matthew 19, 12, Jesus actually talks about men who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Meaning men who have given up children who have embraced celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. That's in Matthew 19, 12. But an even more striking text is from the book of Revelation. And we'll end with this passage. Look at this passage from Revelation. How many of you ever heard about the mysterious 144,000? One, there's a few people. If you've ever been approached by Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll talk to you about the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. Because the Jehovah's Witnesses were founded on the notion that the, this mysterious group of 144,000 people who will be saved in the, in the book of Revelation is a reference to the Jehovah's Witnesses church. Now, they had to adapt that, jer that doctrine. That, they had that when they began. And they had to adapt it once they grew to be more than 144,000. So it's a little different now um, in, in their teaching. But I want you to see something. Who are these 144,000 in Revelation? Hmm, are they Jehovah's Witnesses? I'm not so sure. Look at what it says here. Revelation 14 says this. John is speaking, the apostle. He says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had their name and the, his father's name written on their foreheads. Interesting. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and for the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are spotless. Revelation 14, 1-5. Wow, who is this mysterious group of 144,000? Well, the first thing you might note about them is they're obviously 144,000 men, because it says they have not defiled themselves with women. Now, women, ladies, remain calm, remain calm. This language is simply the language of priestly purity from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if a priest was serving in the temple and he had sexual relations, it would be a ritual defilement. It would be a ritual impurity, and he could no longer function as priest. So what John is saying here is that these are 144,000 priests who are virgins, i.e. they are what? Celibate. They've not had relations with women. And you can also see that they're priests by the very first image. It says that they had their name, the name of the Father and the name of the Lamb on their foreheads. Well, in the Old Testament, guess who had a name written on his forehead? The high priest. He wore a band that had a signet on his forehead that said, Holy to the Lord. The name of God was written on his head. So these are 144,000 priests. They're celibate and they're men. And notice what it says. They sing a new song that no one else can sing. Only they can sing that song. And it resounds in the heavens. And what is that song? It is the Mass. Remember, the Mass can be said, but the Mass is also what? Sung. In particular, the Eucharistic prayer is a song. So this is a special group of men who are celibate who can sing this new song. And notice what it says here. And this is the essence of the priesthood. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. What's the Lamb? Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in what form? The Eucharist. So who are these celibate men who follow the Eucharist wherever He goes? They are the priesthood. And notice, how many are there? 144,000? What is that? 12 times 12 times 1,000. 
It's the 12 apostles times the 12 tribes perfected in the new covenant priesthood. And what church is it that has a celibate priesthood? Last time I checked, it's the Catholic Church. So is the priesthood biblical? You'd better believe it. And we thank God for them.